Well, I'm delighted to uh, do the next talk. And uh, the first five years of this grant, I spoke every year because it was a grant. But in the last 10 years, uh, I have done a talk about every third year in this session. And so not only am I happy to be back at this podium, I'm looking forward to 2021. Uh, and so um, what I'd like to do is to bring you up to date on some of the things that are happening in, in my lab on the fertility management of cancer patients, um, particularly as it relates to um, options for um, uh, bioprosthetic options or engineered options for transplant. And this really represents uh, the gap in knowledge that we're still um, facing, which is that there can be live births from tissue transplant. Um, from both adult and um, from pediatric patients, but um, the efficiency of that transplant in the best labs is about 30 percent, and even in those cases, the uh, potential for transferring disease, if there is um, a case that's counterindicated, is something that represents an opportunity for alternative ways for um, uh, follicle development outside the uh, in vivo setting. And this is important for our pediatric cancer patients, both for their eventual fertility needs, but more for the uh, endocrine needs of those patients, particularly as they transition through uh, their pediatric uh, years. And so um, for pediatric cancer patients, often these are those who have a very high likelihood of um, sterilizing treatment, and those tissues that are collected oftentimes will have residual disease. So today what I'd like to do in this uh, time we have together is to bring you up to date on a few topics, um, those having to do with follicle maturation in vitro, and some of this is a reminder, and for some of you this might be a little new, uh, to talk just for a moment about some of the ways we're looking at high fidelity oocyte management. How do we know if these oocytes that are developed in vitro would have the competency necessary to support live healthy offspring? Um, to talk a little bit about the endocrine hormone production from these uh, tissue uh, constructs uh, and uh, with a uh, no, uh, notion towards eventual long-term durable transplants that could aid in um, pubertal transition and eventually transition to cyclical hormones that could support uh, systemic health for uh, these individuals. So I think for many of you, you're aware that my prism through which I look really is a structure function one. Um, is there a structural context that can inform a developmental competence? And so the oocyte has this uh, in, uh, beautiful organization of the somatic cells uh, uh, and the oocyte, and those that are most proximal to the oocyte are actually supporting metabolically uh, the development of the oocyte um, uh, through time. And so when one takes these cells away from each other, for example, putting them on flat petri dishes, that um, relationship is disrupted, essentially um, having that oocyte go into a little bit of a metabolic stress. Uh, and so the thought was if we could, in fact, uh, maintain those um, essential connections, perhaps the oocyte could uh, be maintained uh, for uh, longer periods of time in a healthy uh, state. And so over time, we have uh, collaborated with uh, Lonnie Shea, a biomedical engineer first here at Northwestern, and then uh, now he is at University of Michigan, gave a talk here last year about some of the work his group has done and that, um, that overlapped with our group in the development of this process known as encapsulated in vitro follicle growth. Essentially isolating follicles from uh, ovarian tissues, either from human or cow or other species, uh, most predominantly from mouse, um, where we can isolate individual follicle types and encapsulate them into a variety of um, biomaterials. Alginate has been um, the material that has been most utilitarian, but we've used a whole variety of other uh, materials in our development of um, new notions of how function, how the uh, structure of the surrounding tissue actually informs biological function. So by uh, isolating and placing those follicles in vitro, we've been able to show that the follicle unit is autonomous in its ability to make hormones. And before these studies, it was really not possible to have the somatic cells produce hormones uh, autonomously. You had to add androstene dione. So it turns out that when you maintain this oocyte somatic cell complex, over at the beginning, the secondary follicles, early secondary follicles with two layers of somatic cells do not make appreciable hormone. But over time, and probably under the direction of this engagement between the oocyte and the somatic cells, they do begin this process of, of um, differentiation, proliferation and differentiation 
resulting in a theca-like um, cell layer at the periphery, a particular geometric distance from the oocyte uh, with the inner cells uh, maintaining the granulosa cell phenotype. So a uh, star in the outer cells, the theca-like cells, and then the granulosa cells expressing the inhibin alpha subunit. And as a consequence, of course, then you can begin to produce the peptide and uh, steroid hormones uh, in these um, particular cell types. And uh, over time, then, you have the movement of the oocyte from the center location to an acentric location with the production of an antrum. You're looking down on a three-dimensional structure. Um, and uh, then there is the ability of these uh, structures to then ovulate in vitro. Uh, and uh, this was a discovery made by Robin Scorey uh, now about three years ago, where uh, the addition of HCG to the mature uh, follicles will allow for a singular rupture zone within the movement of the oocyte from the inside to the outside with the expansion of the cumulus cells um, uh, uh, from these uh, tissues. It is one of my favorite biological processes, this process of ovulation, where uh, there is this autocatalytic self-destructive event within an internal organ. Uh, and uh, I get to talk to a lot of engineers, and that sentence usually is enough to send people for the, for the doors. But I know for this group, that is something that we all embrace. And so seeing ovulation occur with such fidelity is really quite exciting. And of course, there is a singular rupture zone that is uh, developed in vivo. Um, but we also can show in this in vitro setting, where the hormone is able to contact the tissue on all sides, that it is not the apposition to the surface of the ovary that we once thought represented the orientation of ovulation. But in fact, ovulation itself is intrinsic to the rupture zone, is intrinsic itself to the follicle unit. So um, the ability to make uh, the hormones as well as to uh, differentiate into a structure that can receive hormonal instruction over time uh, is now fully mimicked within the system. We then uh, went on to look at the oocytes, which do uh, mature at a high rate. And in fact, that follicle structure then reseals that uh, rupture zone, uh, and the somatic cells uh, convert from the granulosa cell phenotype into the luteal phenotype. Uh, and this occurs in a very rapid period of time once the oocyte cumulus complex is removed within just a few hours, and you can see that uh, expansion of the cytoplasmic uh, morphology that you would see in luteal tissues in vivo. We can now use this to look at mechanisms of ovulation because, again, we have the autonomy of the follicle unit, not in the context of the full ovary, and we hope this is going to allow us to identify better ways to control uh, this latter process of follicular maturation. And those uh, oocytes that are matured can, in fact, support live, healthy offspring. And I think I'll continue to show this particular slide, my two favorite mice, in most of my talks, probably until I retire. So 2021, you're still going to see newborn and new age, which represents some of the earliest mice that were born from this uh, particular technology, the first time we were able to show that you could get complete, complete development to the oocyte from a two-layer secondary all the way to live, healthy offspring. So um, we've also, uh, so what I've shown you is uh, just from the uh, two-layer secondary cells, but as you know from prior talks from this podium, we have moved back to the primordial follicles and have been able to develop uh, strategies for those tissues uh, in human and in mouse as well. But what I thought I'd share with you today is a little bit of an update on how we're using some of these follicles to drive endocrinology. And so let me start with a premise uh, of, um, of how I think we can use these uh, in the long run, and that is that um, I think that everyone in this room will agree with me that reproductive hormones impact every tissue of the body. Both testosterone from the male and estrogen from the females are conditioning and important to overall systemic health. So it certainly is critical that we're managing uh, the, uh, uh, the fertility hopes for our young cancer patients. But I would argue it's also critically important that we're managing the endocrine health for our cancer patients. And so this also extends the utility of the work we're doing from the youngest ages to older. So a woman who's 36, 37, 38 may already have the fam family size she's interested in, but um, to go into a premature menopause at 40 years old comes with uh, the um, risk of uh, increased uh, risk of cardiovascular disease and certainly osteoporosis. And so we want to uh, understand better how we can 
uh, enable um, better endocrine hormone function over time. And potentially, of course, uh, add back hormone from steroids is important, but there are many other things that the ovaries uh, do to uh, enable healthy, uh, a healthy overall system. So that's our premise. And the problem, though, is that all of the work that has been done in the past to really look at the engagement of the ovary with even tissues within the reproductive tract, let alone uh, cartilage or uh, heart or other tissues, uh, is predicated on the Petri dish. And uh, many, uh, I think almost everyone has had experience with a Petri dish in high school biology. Um, but the problem is that these uh, Petri dishes um, do not, in fact, um, allow for interaction between uh, tissues in the body. And so the potential here is that if we could come up with some kind of um, system where we could orchestrate the engagement of the ordinary interactions that all of our organs have with each other, we might be able to better uh, mimic health and we might be able to mimic better disease models that ultimately will allow us to understand something more about the genes that are uh, programmed in terms of both health and disease, the epigenetic information that is imposed on that genetics, the environmental factors, which we have a very hard time understanding the specific effects on individual diseases, drug interactions, um, the effect of obesity, sex, and age on multi-organ, multi-etiology diseases. And in particular for our oncofertility world, part of the uh, concern for many chemotherapeutics is the personalized way in, in, in the way those drugs are metabolized and in really pathbreaking work that Irene Sue did when she was um, uh, with the uh, consortium um, showed that there were a variety of differences between um, those um, uh, P450 genes that would um, relate then to whether or not that individual had a highly effective treatment for um, breast cancer in that particular case versus the uh, fertility concerns of that drug. And so um, the promise then, you're getting the P's here. Did everybody get the P's throughout this? So the promise, I think, is endocrinology in a dish, a new technology that um, um, was introduced a little bit last year to you. And this is the notion of the EVATAR, the uh, concept that we can mimic a biology that integrates all the organs of the body essentially in the way our organs are communicating in uh, vivo. And the other advantage to this is that now by adding dynamics to the system, our hope is that we can keep macro tissues alive for longer periods of time. So unlike a Petri dish where you maximize the um, cell growth and then reach a density and have to split those cells, we can actually keep organ level explants uh, surviving and interacting and those interactions then inform the biology of each of the tissues. And so um, working with uh, Draper Laboratories, uh, we actually have invented this technology uh, called the EVATAR that allows for these uh, interactions to take place. And the final P is the, is the promise of personalization. If we can make this kind of technology work, the idea ultimately would be that we could take iPS cells from, our, from each of us and have a representation of our organs, uh, not just ovaries and testis, but liver and kidney and other uh, organs that represent who we are and allow us then to test uh, drug efficacy uh, or metabolism within this particular setting. Uh, and so that represents the uh, kind of work we're trying to do, but of course it requires us to change basic research, discovery research a little bit because, of course, we're all used to the Petri dish. And uh, I think I've banned the Petri dish effectively from my laboratory. I don't know if there's a few, my lab sitting back here. No, there are a few Petri dishes there. Okay, let's get rid of all of them. Um, but uh, the idea is to actually radically rethink the way we do biology. Now, I'll tell you this is hard work. It took us five years to get to this one figure. Um, but the notion is that sh or if we're able to actually effectively model the, the ways our organs uh, interact as endocrine units, um, we potentially could have uh, better, uh, more eff effective ways of looking at basic discovery research. So uh, in just a few slides, I'll tell you about the work that was done by Hunter Rogers, who is a graduate student in the lab and an engineering student, uh, master's student, uh, and now a PhD student, and Shuo Shuo, uh, who uh, was a postdoc in the lab and is now an assistant professor at the University of, Southern, of um, South Carolina. 
And uh, they, together with Jonathan Capetta and Jeff Bornstein from Draper Labs and a large group of uh, members of the laboratories of myself, Julie Kim, and Joanna Burdett, worked collaboratively um, to put this um, thing that definitively does not look like a Petri dish into the middle of my lab. And it is this big, huge rack that has computers and peristaltic uh, and uh, pumps. And uh, it represents the technology that goes into trying to recapitulate the way our body so easily um, uh, produces uh, vasculature that moves um, um, macromolecules and blood around so easily. In the end, we created um, three different systems, the solo microfluidic platform, the duet microfluidic platform, and the quintet. Um, solo allows for a single uh, tissue to be under uh, dynamic flow. The duet allows two uh, organs to be interacting uh, either in a unidimensional direction or by recirculating. The recirculating we call my cure. Uh, and then the quintet allows for five tissues to be interacting and to be recirculating um, with time. Uh, and so we developed a series of different modules, one of which is for, you can essentially think for organoids. The follicle is like an organoid, essentially. Uh, and you can see within um, these um, struts, I think you can see the little white areas. Those are our favorite little follicles um, that are um, sitting there, about five, uh, it's 10 or 12 of them here and here under flow in this direction. And you can see when we take an up-close image, these are ovarian follicles that are under dynamic flow in this setting. And so um, using uh, this system, we were able to show that the follicles uh, could, in fact, grow and mature. And we had all of the hallmarks of development that you saw in the encapsulated in vitro follicle growth, including the ability to uh, have ovulation on platform with then the conversion of the somatic cells into the luteal tissues. As a consequence, we then could uh, imagine looking at the hormones um, because we had all the signature events associated with follicle dynamics and, in fact, allowed these systems to go over a full 28-day period, a four-week um, experiment with, in this case, uh, follicle cultures. And we're under, we are providing the um, uh, pituitary hormone control, so FSH is under our control, and you can see the rise of estradiol as these follicles mature. And then under the influence of HCG, the uh, um, estradiol falls, and we have a uh, luteal, uh, luteal uh, phase. Well, we then, uh, through a number of other experiments, then put together a series of tissues, including the mouse ovaries. We're not using human tissue here, only mouse tissue in this particular uh, series of studies. The remainder of the tissues, though, are human. Human fallopian tube, human uterus, human cervix, and human liver organoids, all connected within now a five-organ system, the EVATAR. And now what you're saying really for the first time is organs in vitro both producing the hormones, but you also see that they are being consumed by those downstream tissues. And you have to go back to the Jenkins papers in 1962 to find the original steroidogenesis production and consumption models. And this will now allow us to model that with only these organs in play. And that represents a really exciting new dynamic for our field of endocrinology. Um, and I'm not, again, this is a 28-day cycle now with the day of ovulation um, pivoted to the day zero. And I'm not going to show you all the downstream tissue. Let me just show you one from Joanna Burdett's lab, which is the um, uterus, or, I'm sorry, the fallopian tube. And of course, the fallopian tube has um, cilia that moves the ovulated oocyte down to the point where it can be fertilized. And those cilia are setting up microfluidic dynamics, and the sperm can only move against a fluidic flow. Sperm cannot swim with a fluid, with, uh, they cannot swim downstream, they can only swim upstream. Uh, and so these cilia are necessary for the maintenance of that microfluidic dynamic. And then at the end of 28 days, I know this movie will work, at the end of 28 days, what you're seeing are those cilia are still, in fact, uh, beating. And we could show differences, uh, Joanna Burdett's lab could show differences in the uh, beat intensity of the cilia, whether they were under the influence of estrogen or under the influence of progesterone. And so this uh, function is really quite remarkable because it's being maintained uh, over an extended uh, period of time. And you're seeing both the cilia as well as some of the uh, muscular movements within this explant. 
and Joanna and her lab is taking this on forward to look at a variety of, um, of uh, concerns associated with ovarian cancer, which we've never really been able to model in vitro. And then uh, Schwo and the team then added back in the hormones to ask if the tissue was still viable over that luteal phase. Of course, we had luteolysis. We put in the HCG and then allowed for the lutea, luteal phase to undergo its normal demise. But if we maintained um, the system with uh, HCG, prolactin, uh, and a few other things, we could, in fact, maintain that luteal function out for the full uh, 14 days. And we suspect and are um, getting ready at the first of the year to restart the EVATAR and try and go for uh, two and three rounds of cycles within one tissue. We've also asked whether or not we can eliminate the insulin from our studies. Of course, all of biology that we know using the Petri dish is not only problematic because it's flat plastic and it's not interacting with other tissues, it's problematic because the insulin levels are capped largely by this little product that we all buy from Sigma called ITS. And it represents insulin at a, at a level that would make all the clinicians in the world shriek. Uh, and so what we've tried to do is remove that insulin by adding in islets and putting the islets into the tissue and now not adding exogenous insulin, but asking the islets to in fact function. And this is work done by uh, Hunter Rogers and Emma Gargas showing that the insulin can be maintained over uh, 21 and in fact they have up to 28 days. And in fact, in the absence of added insulin, the insulin that is brought by the islets can completely support function of the ovarian tissue. It also can support the uh, final stages, uh, which is the ovulation uh, mechanism. And this is what done by um, one of the graduate students in, in the lab, Jiang Zhu. And this shows ovulation from the entire ovarian tissue. Uh, and that represents, again, a real breakthrough for the lab. We're also working on the male side of the equation, and Max Edmonds uh, is developing what we're calling the dude cube or ADTAR. And this, we hope, is going to allow us to put the male um, uh, system together with the testis and uh, other um, uh, organs to, again, be able to model uh, liver metabolism for a variety of drugs, uh, as well as to begin to model uh, spermatogenesis and its development. So um, the EVATAR represents a premise, a problem, a promise, potential, and personalized. And my hope is that eventually this will allow us to usher in an era of more personalized drug testing because this will allow us to represent each of us in this kind of dynamic system. I think it will allow for better toxicology testing so that, again, we can look uh, more specifically at organ level function. Uh, we still do, of course, need to include adipose in the tissue for some of, for in the system, and that's something that one of the students is working on right now. I think it may change the way we think about signaling pathways as we've all learned them in our textbooks, because the way we've learned about these uh, signaling pathways is all informed by a piece of flat plastic. And I think as we begin to look at each of these organ systems as explants or as more organ-like structures, and as we see them interacting with hormones like estrogen and progesterone or testosterone, which is rarely ever put into the background media for studies on cardiovascular disease or bone or any other tissue, I think we're going to have a reimagining of how these signaling pathways, in fact, work. Uh, and I think that's really exciting. And on top of that, then, instead of isolated cell signaling, I think we're also going to get this integrated cell signaling. And so that is the hope for this uh, particular kind of system. So what I've shown you is that ovarian follicles can mature in vitro and that we can phenocopy many of these uh, system, many of these steps um, uh, in vitro. The bottom, ses, ses, uh, the bottom set of images is from some of the human work that we've done. And um, I've told you that we can get the follicles to grow, to secrete hormones, to differentiate, and uh, to have ovulatory mechanics, and then ultimately live healthy births in mice. And I really think there are three things that we should take away from the studies that I've just shown you, which is, of course, we know that hormones are really in control of follicle dynamics. So hormones is what we've always known, and we should, um, we should always keep that in mind. But in addition to the hormonal impact uh, on follicle maturation, there are two other uh, critical features of follicle dynamics, and that is the architecture and the environment. The architecture means the precise geometric relationship of the oocyte to its surrounding somatic cells. And it's only when we start to get that geometry right do we actually get the oocyte into a position where it actually can function. 
And so some of the next studies we're doing is, are being done by Emma Gargas to look at how these geometries and the interactions inform not only the maturational health but the epigenetic health of those uh, developing oocytes. And that is informed by the physical environment. So as we look at that physical environment and how that shapes the effect of the, um, of the um, sensing of those cells of their environment and how that also informs biology. And so hormones, architecture, environment, these are the three things that are necessary to allow us to really understand how to mature follicles. So with that in mind, we've, of course, continued on this path to try and uh, adapt some of the stuff we've done for mouse into human. And in fact, here's uh, one of the human follicles with now the oocyte after mitosis of the somatic cells. The oocyte is now on the move to the periphery of that particular follicle with ultimately the ability to get um, GV intact follicles. And through the National Physicians Cooperative um, in an index uh, case, in a, a set of um, cases where all the tissue from the MPC for an 18-month period of time went into one protocol, we had 44 patients, 65 follicles, and from that, four human M2 eggs with all the signatures of good quality eggs that we could measure um, that was published in scientific reports. Um, but let's take a look at what makes a good egg. So I showed you a good egg from the perspective of M2, but of course in the U.S. we can't continue with that line of investigation under federal funding. We need um, alternative funding to be able to look for uh, whether or not that M2 egg could in fact be either parthenogenically active, activated or in fact uh, otherwise fertilized. And so um, over the years, our lab has been asking what makes a good egg, and really, again, through this notion of structure informing function. And so Francesca Duncan, when she was in the lab, and of course last year she was here at this podium giving a talk on the wonderful work she's doing looking at egg maturation, and uh, she's looked at the structure-function relationships of the chromatin as they change uh, uh, over time. And she, together with Jessica Hornick, when Jess was also in the lab as a postdoc, began to look at the individual dynamics of the chromatin uh, that they could isolate from uh, the individual M2 eggs and be able to look at the dynamics of the physical rigidity over time. Being able to pull individual chromosomes is really a talent uh, that I think uh, Jess maybe alone has, um, but uh, this in fact has been done for mitotic cells, um, showing that there is an increase in kind of the fibrotic nature of the chromosomes with, uh, with time and, and culture. This has never been looked at in, uh, in meiotic chromosomes. And the meiotic chromosomes are about tenfold more structurally rigid than mitotic chromosomes, something that I think does inform function and something we should keep in mind. And secondly, uh, as, the, uh, as we uh, uh, accumulate data from older aged animals, those uh, measures of fibrosis increase. Uh, and so you get about uh, fourfold more fibrotic chromosomes with age. Well, these are really exciting kinds of studies to do, but you can imagine if we apply this to our human eggs, we would destroy that human egg. Uh, it's an invasive method. So we wanted to uh, find ways to look at this in a non-invasive way. And so in a discovery that was made um, um, in my lab with uh, Tom O'Halloran, it looks like this media is not found, so I can't show this movie to you. But what we discovered is that during meiotic maturation, there is an uptake of the inorganic element zinc. And that zinc is required to allow the oocyte to go through the terminal stages of meiotic maturation. And then at the time of fertilization, that zinc, which is now accrued to levels that are higher than in any other somatic cell and higher than the oocyte during, match, during the rest of its lifespan, has to be eliminated. And it does so with a uh, release of the zinc in what we call the zinc spark. Now, the zinc spark represents now a non-invasive way that we can begin to look at egg quality by sampling uh, the media. And so um, Francesca and others uh, in the lab developed a protocol by which we were able to isolate human oocytes, and again, not using any federal funding, but with uh, funding for the microscopes from the Keck Foundation and funding from Faring Pharmaceuticals, uh, we were able to look at human oocytes and were able to confirm that there is, in fact, a zinc spark that uh, occurs at the time of activation, uh, either by, um, uh, by uh, parthenogenic activation through a variety of methods. 
And so that's really quite exciting because that says that um, this major moment in assisted reproduction fills in some of the blanks about how meiosis actually works, but it also may lead to ways that we can sample the media in a non-invasive way and look at some of these human M2 eggs that, are mature, that can be matured in vitro uh, to allow for um, further development. Our goal would be uh, in future years to be able to do a similar National Physicians Cooperative or open study to allow for one full year of tissue collection to now ask whether or not those M2 eggs that we could mature in vitro would have the correct inorganic signature that would suggest that they would be um, appropriate for um, fertilization in vivo. So what makes a good egg? Well, certainly the chromosome structure and function, as well as oocyte-specific genes, but they also, in addition, must spark, must sparkle. <laughs> So um, just finally, in the last few minutes, the fertility needs of pediatric cancer patients is something we've been quite interested in. And Monica Aranda uh, last year did bring you up to date on the work she had done as a postdoc and now as an independent investigator uh, at Lurie Children's, where we originally decellularized the ovary to begin to look at it as a bioactive scaffold to understand the structural context that these follicles reside in within the tissue, whether in the, they're in the cortex as a primordial follicle or within the medulla as a uh, maturing follicle. And this really showed an architecture of a soft organ that, could, that was ex just as an exacting as you can imagine each of our bones. So all of our bones have very specific structures that you can reliably find between individuals. And in fact, I believe our soft organs do as well. We just have not mapped that, org that structure in the same way we've done with DEXA of our bones. Uh, and so I think um, one of the things that's most exciting and one of the outcomes from the National Physicians Cooperative was that uh, human follicles could be isolated and placed on one of these decellularized structural um, papers that um, we did in collaboration with Ramil Shaw. And this paper is really fantastic because you can do origami with it, and that certainly is most exciting. Uh, and I have a little swan sitting on my desk, which is quite cool. But in addition, you can place the ovarian follicles that have been isolated largely away from the uh, surrounding cancer cells, and they can be maintained on this structure while then being opposed to uh, remaining tissues. This was uh, sutured into a bovine ovary. And for the surgeons in the room, please forgive the sutures. They were just basic scientists. We know you would do better. And we also would not be suturing it back to an ovary. Obviously, the ovary in these cases would largely be uh, eliminated, and so this could be um, sutured back in other places. Um, but together with Lonnie Shea, we showed that even though we could isolate follicles in a mouse model that had a high burden of ovarian cancer within the tissue, we could reduce the level of uh, metastasis from that isolated follicle. We could not eliminate it. So um, this represents an interesting next step for us to understand something about the cellular context. But the most important thing is that, again, we can learn from this architecture of the different regions of the ovary and use that uh, as a structural design uh, template for um, the uh, ovaries. And so uh, with um, uh, Monica um, and Ramil Shaw, we were able to develop a series of models for the different regions of the ovary, and then by transplanting in those follicles into these uh, different architectures, we're able to show that the interleaving that we have in the outer cortex of the, of the ovary was, in fact, the best for maintaining ovarian uh, func or fo follicle function in vitro. And you can see that, in fact, when we added the uh, gonadotropins, we could, in fact, get ovulation out of this in vitro bioinspired scaffold as well. So then uh, we took uh, GFP positive mice and, in fact, put the follicles within uh, this uh, biomaterial. And I want you to really appreciate how vascularized this uh, 3D printed bioprosthetic is. This is after transplant back into a um, into a uh, ovaryectomized uh, prepubertal mouse that uh, Monica uh, did, and you can see how well vascularized this particular tissue becomes. And in fact, at the end of the surgery, at eight weeks, you can still appreciate not only are there large follicles, of course this is a mouse, so there's, they've been going through cycles on a four-day 
periodicity, but you also see smaller follicles within this tissue, suggesting that we have, in fact, been able to set up what we wanted within the tissue, which is this um, um, uh, durable kind of um, cycle where there isn't all the follicles grow at one time, but in fact they set up the hierarchy like we would see in vitro. And in fact, we had the live birth, and I, uh, the name of this first pup was Thesis, uh, which I think is because Monica's collaborator was a PhD student, and she got her thesis as a consequence of this. Uh, but a, a beautiful set of outcomes from this first ever soft organ transplant uh, for a tissue. So there's been a number of discoveries, and in fact, um, this latter discovery of thesis really is 100 years in the making. The first ovarian graft transplant was done by William Tuttle Morris here in Chicago in 1895. And of course, there have been other transplants of tissues along the way. Um, and of course, there have been live births from um, the pioneering work of now Suzuki and Doné and Silber and Anderson and others. Uh, and so this represents uh, part of the continuum of reproductive interventions that are enabling fertility and endocrine support uh, for patients. So um, just to summarize, uh, the engineering uh, of the reproductive axis is to first be able to have an oncofertility program that allows us to collect um, human tissue samples uh, on behalf of the patients who urgently need the work that we're doing to continue uh, to enable their fertile future. And so with that tissue, we've been able to develop the encapsulated in vitro follicle maturation uh, that has led to the human M2 eggs, um, the uh, in, uh, engineered uh, in vitro uh, uh, EVATAR system that will allow not just the reproductive tract to engage, but us to use the ovary and testis to inform other uh, systemic organs on the way to new discoveries about how the reproductive system actually informs the biology of the remainder of the body. And then uh, finally, a little bit on where we are with the artificial ovary, but with the perspective that we really have just started on this pathway, and the future of this work is to really look now at those follicles and how that physical and architectural environment informs the epigenetic as well as genetic health of the offspring. Uh, and so today we have this wonderful global oncofertility community um, with the uh, M2 eggs um, that will be, we hope, um, tested in the future for their ability to mount a zinc spark after the 40 days in culture that we predict will be needed uh, for this next round. We have the ovarian cycle in a dish, and in fact, some of those follicles may be better enabled by placing them within a fluidic dynamic, and that's something that we'll be testing. And then, of course, I indicated the ovarian uh, bioprints process bioprosthetic, bio woo, difficult. So if we now uh, look out from here into the future, we hope to have better cancer control and treatment and better selectivity of patients. We hope for those neoadjuvant fertile protective uh, therapies that you heard from Dr. Hutt and we'll hear from Dr. Kim in just a moment. Um, the in vitro follicle maturation will continue to drive our understanding of the basic biology of follicles in different classes. Uh, and they may be utilitarian for a short period of time in the ovarian bioprosthetics, but certainly the stem cell revolution is coming to gonadal tissues and particularly to germ cells, and I think those will ultimately be the way these get um, populated. Uh, we do need to understand the epigenetic regulation of the germ cell by the tissue itself and by the uh, ex vivo environment, something that we're working on, but of course we're really hoping for the elimination of the field as better and better treatments more um, target the uh, disease itself. And so with that, uh, I hope I've given you a little idea of how engineering uh, enables translation from uh, the bench to the bedside to babies. And with that, I really want to thank our funders who have been tremendous at ensuring that we had the ability to take these high-risk, high-gain uh, projects on, particularly the uh, NICHD and NUCATS uh, that allowed us to take about five years to develop a brand new technology with only one publication. Uh, and that really is something that we are greatly appreciative of. And so with that, I would be happy to take any questions you might have. <laughs>